God of the dim light, God of the aching eyes, God of the exposed, God who was born in a starless night on the ground. If that isn't hope, what is? makes me feel that I am not saved. The sadness I feel is very real. Lord God, I can only come to you for help. Please hear my prayers. Lord God, I give you all the praise. Glory to you, my Savior and Master. Good evening, everybody. I just want to share a few words with you about what we just um, took in. Uh, a few of us at Oak Church have been participating in an uh, artist residency, and uh, most everyone else at Oak Church has also been kind of like doing a few things to prepare for Easter and to enter into Lent. Um, some of the first images you saw uh, was artwork by Bethy Figgy and another friend from the residency that I mentioned. Um, we also had a daily um, kind of Linton practice of making a, a work a day uh, by Sadie Anderson and, and uh, original music with, by Marcus Walton. Um, the music team has also been uh, doing quite a bit of work um, with songs of lament during this season. Uh, we also had a practice this Lent with the church of every Sunday, we would kind of work through psalms and uh, lament and confession and we're invited into uh, opportunities to rewrite psalms. And the song you heard at the end of the video is uh, by Wayne Garrett as part of the congregation. Um, the image in the background right now uh, is kind of a look into our night. Um, the Stations of the Cross images are original artworks from Scott Erickson, otherwise known as Scott the Painter. 
we had the chance to put these up kind of, you can see them in relation to that picnic table. They're pretty large. We did this a couple of years ago uh, for our Stations of the Cross during Lent in the Lakewood Shopping Center, which is down the street from Oak Church and has become kind of a special place in our uh, worshiping life and uh, particularly in the last year. It's kind of a, we've had the Stations of the Cross that you see and in, in a, in a kind of a, worshiping congregation that's been meeting out right there by that right around the corner from where we had those so uh thanks and um you're invited also into this sights and sounds of this this night as nate said welcome and good evening to this and welcome to this Good Friday Joint Worship Service with Oak Church and the Gathering Church. This year has been a long year and a year filled with pain and uncertainty. And so tonight we're going to join our voices together in song as we lament and as we worship God, the God who in Jesus Christ suffers with us and on our behalf. And we'll journey with Jesus to the cross using those images that Nate just pointed out and scripture passages to help us remember and return to the God who seeks us and saves us. So join me now in prayer. Gracious God, we gather this evening to remember the suffering and death of Jesus. He was despised and rejected oppressed and afflicted, yet he was prepared to be wounded for our transgressions. We are overwhelmed by the depth of your love for us and your commitment to defeat evil in all its forms, even when that meant your own suffering and your willingness to make us righteous and bring us home. Jesus poured himself out to death even death on a cross. And so in response to such love and sacrifice, we say thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for not abandoning us. Thank you for suffering with us. Thank you for taking our sin and suffering upon yourself. And thank you for the mercy and forgiveness you offer us. Lord, help us have faith in the midst of suffering, loss, and injustice. Even in the midst of the brokenness in our world and in our own lives, we trust in your presence and your power. We trust that in the middle of this suffering, you, O oh God, are our comfort. And when we stray from you and your ways, draw us back home to you. When the darkness surrounds us and we're afraid, embrace us in your loving arms and give us peace. We place our hope in you. Amen. Out of 
of the miry clay we will rise up someday sorrow won't always last the dark will surely pass woe to the wicked ones for what their hands have done god is our righteous judge and he will raise us up how long how long when will the daughters of zion rejoice in the house of the lord so let your justice roll down 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 how long how long when will the daughters of Zion rejoice in the house of the Lord. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. He said to the disciples, stay here while I go and pray over there. When he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, he began to feel sad and anxious. Then he said to them, I'm very sad as if I am dying. Stay here and keep alert with me. Then he went a short distance farther and fell on his face and prayed, my father, if it's possible, take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not what I want, but what you want. Then one of the 12, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I turn Jesus over to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver. From that time on, he was looking for an opportunity to turn him in. Tis midnight and on all is brow The star is dim that lately shone Tis midnight in the garden now The suffering Savior prays alone Tis midnight and from all removed Emmanuel wrestles alone with fears Even that disciple whom he loved Heeds not his teacher's grief and tears Tis midnight and for others' guilt. The man of sorrows weeps in blood. Yet he who hath in anguish knelt is not for 
forsaken by his God. Tis midnight and from heavenly plains is born the song that angels know. Unheard by mortals are the strains that sweetly soothe the Savior's woe. Tis midnight and on olive's brow the star is dim that lately shone. Tis midnight in the garden now the suffering Savior prays alone. Tis midnight in the garden now the Suffering Savior prays alone. As morning came, the elders of the people, both chief priests and their legal experts, came together and Jesus was brought before the council. They said, if you are the Christ, tell us. He answered, if I tell you, you won't, believe, you won't believe. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer. But from now on, the human one will be seated on the right side of power of God, of the power of God. They all said, are you God's son then? He replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need further testimony? We've heard it from his own lips. The governor's soldiers took Jesus into the governor's house and they gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a red military coat on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a stick in his right hand. Then they bowed down in front of him and mocked him saying, hey, king of the Jews. After they spit on him, they took the stick and struck his head again and again. When they finished mocking him, they stripped him of the military coat, put his own clothes back on him. They led him away to crucify him. Please sing along.
If you know me, you'll know that one of my favorite writers and quotes from that writer is Frederick Beekner. And um, one, one of the things that he's written that is particularly on my mind in a week like this and a night like this is, here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Do not be afraid. Maybe we all know this better now than we did 14 months ago. Maybe some of us are still working on the do not be afraid part of that. But we've seen the terrible. We've felt the terrible. We've known the terrible. It's the terrible of isolation and the terrible of death. So many deaths, the terrible of cynicism and nihilism and of bodies being devalued and objectified and killed, it's of injustice and of nationalism and of white supremacy, of malignant scans and of local gun violence, of domestic abuse, of terror, of addiction, of children at the border and prisoners in cells, of backs against the wall with no end in sight. Terrible things will happen. Terrible things have happened. In fact, the terrible is so massive, so foregrounded, sometimes we feel guilty about the beautiful that we've also seen and felt and known. We don't know how to articulate those two things happening in the same space. The beautiful of intimacy, of service, of slowness, of smallness, of being near to loved ones and having a heart grown fond by the absence of others, of learning new hobbies and finishing new projects, of reorienting and recalibrating how we spend our time, of knowing your roommate better, your spouse better, your kids better, your neighbors better, of proximity, of the resilience of hope and fellowship making a slow, small way. Beautiful things will happen. 
beautiful things have happened. We barely have the capacity to hold these two things together, the beautiful and the terrible. It's as we were planning tonight's stations liturgy, someone in the group described how the mood should be for this as like Christmas, but sad. Someone's text message this week auto-corrected Holy Week to Guilt Week. You know, it's so easy to slide to one side of the spectrum here. This is one of the reasons over at Oak Church we've been soaking in the language of the Psalms during this Lenten season to infuse our vocabulary, to give um, a voice, to open up our senses to this kind of language of good and bad, of beautiful and terrible, and the ways they occupy the same space. It's a language of beautiful, terrible that not only describes our world, not only survives our world, but deeply understands ourselves and our capacities and our failures and also participates in God's healing in this world. Take Psalm 22, which starts, My God, my God, why have you left me all alone? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my anguished groans? My God, I cry out during the day, but you don't answer. Even at nighttime, I don't stop. You are the Holy One enthroned. You are Israel's praise. Our ancestors trusted you. They trusted you and you rescued them. They cried out to you and they were saved. They trusted you and they weren't ashamed. These are accusations. Part of lament is just reminding God that things aren't right and they don't look right from exactly where you're standing. That's the beginning of lament. This situation of the psalmist is terrible in every sense of the word, isolated and alone, left even by God, in anguish, unanswered. Maybe this past year was the first time in your life that these words became remotely sayable for you in some honest way. Maybe you know these words well, they're really familiar. If you do know these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is good news that these words come out of Jesus's mouth on the cross. A theologian has said, Jesus is God's psalm for the world. It's not an accident that the psalms become the hymnal of the church. When we pray them, we pray Jesus. So we're connected and we're included in Christ's words, in Christ's body. And when things are bad, when the floor has dropped out, when there's no end in sight and no way things are feasibly going to get any better anytime soon, it's easy to come out of his body, out of our bodies. We do that by seeking distraction, by numbing ourselves by seeking fantasy, by powering up or resting control. But on the cross, Jesus stayed in his body. Jesus felt everything we could possibly ever feel. The, the entirety of the suffering of the whole world. To paraphrase the apostle, Jesus, who knew no terrible, became the terrible, that we might become the beautiful of God. We see a shift then in the psalm later. Psalm 22 continues in verse 22. I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you in the very center of the congregation. All of you who revere the Lord, praise him. All of you who are Jacob's descendants, honor him. All of you who are Israel's offspring, stand in awe of him. Because he didn't despise or detest the suffering one who suffered. He didn't hide his face from me. 
No, he listened, and I cried out to him for help. I will declare your name. I will praise your name. The forgotten one remembers. The unsunned one is embraced by the sprinting prodigal father. He didn't despise or detest the suffering of the sufferer. He didn't hide his face from me. No, he listened. Even as the floor dropped out, all the way to Sheol, all the way to the dead, all the way to hell itself, Jesus was acquainted with this bottom downward mobility. After all, he, he started in a, in a manger to an unwed mother. He, he knew poverty. Even as he ministered, he didn't have a place to lay his head. But even as the floor has dropped, the ceiling has also risen. On the cross, Jesus has called us into this increased bandwidth, this increased capacity, a realer reality of the beautiful and the terrible and everything in between. Do not be afraid. This is what it means to be called into the life of God, abundant life, to have our heart's capacities expanded, not to come out of the world or out of our bodies, but more deeply into them. Consider how this God who hears and sees is also the God who feels all things at all times. So in getting in touch with this, this massive bandwidth, this beautiful, terrible, all of these things happening, we're actually becoming more like God. When Paul tells us to weep and rejoice with others, he's inviting us into a community that experiences the full range of God's desire for creation. God is the one who ultimately rejoices with the rejoicing and grieves with those who are in grief. And sometimes, many times, these things are all happening at the same time and in the same space. And God is big enough and caring enough to feel it all, to know it all, to do it all. Good Friday welcomes us into the good news that our hearts, in our minds, in our wherewithal can be expanded into God's where God is not absent nor far. God is not forsaken even the most God forsaken people and places and times and things and events. Because God has been on that terrible cross. That this world of sin, our sin has produced and continues to try to reproduce in this world. An instrument of terror, that moment of forsakenness somehow brought us close, brought us in, created a beautiful welcome, a praise not from the margins, but now from the very center of the congregation. This should challenge us in these hard times. It should comfort us too, but it should challenge us in these hard times. When many of us have the privilege to choose whether we wanna look away or move away from suffering. The fatigue is real. I understand when it's, when, when it's hard and it, it feels like we've been in the same place and seen these same things and we just wanna to zone out, to mute, to look away. We can choose to numb, we can choose to mute, we can choose to leave our bodies, but we should be challenged to sit and to stay. Like the women by Jesus' side after all the other disciples left. To weep for the terrible, but to look and to hope and to pray in that deep, beautiful working inside of it all. On the cross, Jesus' body yields more than it is. That's how grace works. Inside of this grotesque criminal's death on an instrument of shame outside of the city gates, Jesus becomes our salvation. Have you ever thought of that? The writer of Hebrews somehow declares that 
for the joy set before him, you didn't think joy was going to come up in that sentence. Jesus endured the cross, scorning the shame and sits down at the right hand of the father. Jesus's joy is somehow the counter agent of despair. It's a, it's a work of resistance against death. And then we're called into this joy, even on a night like tonight. Jesus' terrible death doesn't only make sense of the world's suffering, but by God's creative grace, it can even make it beautiful. So as we move through this season of sorrow, will you stay in your body? Will you lay down your defenses and your controls, trusting that God will take care of you, that God is enough? that God is there, that God cares? Will you call out to this God who hasn't forsaken you, but who hears? Because he's been there. He's gone ahead of you to the cross. Will you join others who are grieving? Like really join in their grief, stay there? Or join with those who are rejoicing, even if that's not remotely where you are? Allowing God to open and to grow and to shape your heart after God's own heart. And will you walk with Jesus into this abundant, overflowing, expanded, and overlapping, beautiful, terrible way of living in this world? Into this rich and full life that is only gained by losing it. And only fulfilled by being emptied. Will you all pray with me? Lord Jesus, we confess that we we're rarely capable of holding these things together. <laughs> we, we, we sing these songs and uh, we want to know your cross as a comfort and as our salvation as, as um, a reversal um, that, that even cast our sin as, as a way to know you better and to be saved by you. Um, we're limited in our ability to do that, uh, grow our ability to do that so that we can live in this world and see it all and experience it all and have our heart shaped to your heart so that we um, can feel deeply and um, participate in your healing that comes through sacrifice, that comes through relying on you and calling out to you. Lord, we thank you for the cross. We thank you that you have gone there and that you're with us. We pray all this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that I said to you, you must be born anew. God's Spirit blows wherever it wishes. You hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. It's the same with everyone who's born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said, how are these things possible? Jesus answered, you are a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? I assure you that we speak about what we know and testify about what we have seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the human one. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Jesus replied, the time has come for the human one to be glorified. I assure you that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it can only be a single seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their lives will lose them. And those who hate their lives in this world will keep them forever. Whoever serves me must follow me. Wherever I am, there my servant will also be. My Father will honor whoever serves me.
Simon, a man from Cyrene, Alexander and Rufus's father was coming in from the countryside. They forced him to carry his cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means skull place. They also led two other criminals to be executed with Jesus. When they arrived at the place called the skull, they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They drew lots as a way of dividing up his clothing. The people were standing around watching. But the leaders sneered at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he really is the Christ sent from God, the chosen one. O oh, crucified Jesus, Son of the Father, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, eternal word of God, we worship you. O crucified Jesus, holy temple of God, dwelling place of the most high, gate of heaven, burning flame of love, we worship you. O crucified Jesus, sanctuary of justice and love, full of kindness, source of all faithfulness, we worship you. O crucified Jesus, ruler of every heart, in you are the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In you dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. We worship you. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Tears 
God, our comfort, oh, be near. Come, oh, come, be our light. Drive out the darkness, come. And all the violence come. Do not be silent, come. We cling to your promise, come. You'll break all injustice, come. Jesus, come. Come. Jesus, come. From noon until three in the afternoon, the whole earth was dark. At about three, Jesus cried out, with a loud shout, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you left me? After hearing him, some standing there said, he's calling Elijah. One of them ran over, took a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a pole. He offered it to Jesus to drink. But the rest of them said, Let's see if Elijah will come and save him. Again, Jesus cried out with a loud shout. Then he died. Jesus' invitation to the Passover table is extended to all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in love, forgiveness and peace with one another. Two days before the festival of unleavened bread, Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. They asked him, where do you want us to prepare it? And he replied, as soon as you entered into Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, Say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. They went off to the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal. The following evening, Monday, Thursday, they ate the Passover meal about midnight, and the following day, the day we call Good Friday, Jesus prays, if it is possible, Father, remove the cup of death set before me, but for our own sake, this was not possible. So Jesus is betrayed, condemned, and crucified so that we come on this most holy night to this most sacred table, remembering that the Apostle Paul tells us we should examine ourselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup. Jesus, knowing what was about to happen, gave bread and wine to his disciples, teaching them that it represented his body and blood given for us in the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, let us bow now and confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we do not always love you with our whole heart. We have failed at times in the easy things and other times in the hard things. We sinned by omission and commission, and we are truly sorry. Forgive us, we pray, that we too may one day live in union with you in heaven. Amen. Hear now the good news. Christ died for us, 
while we were yet sinners, God has forgiven us once and for all. Every soul who repents is forgiven and free. Now, wherever you are, we are all together in the presence of God, the Father, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we sit at the Passover table with Christ this very night and receive his sacrifice for our eternal life. Thanks be to God. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave thanks for it. And he said to his disciples, when you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks for it. And he said, drink from this cup, all of you. And when you drink from it, remember that this is the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. When you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father, your son raised the dead in his earthly life. But he did not spare himself. He submitted in love and trust that the third day would indeed come. And so father and son, through the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit, suffered. One not sparing the other and the other not sparing himself all for us and we scarce can take it in thank you for these elements of bread and cup which we are about to receive in remembrance of what you have done for us amen this is the body of christ broken for you take and eat. This is the cup of salvation poured out for you. Take and drink for as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Amen. Savior, 
Tis I deserve thy place Look on me with thy favor Vouchsafe to me thy grace What language shall I borrow To thank thee, dearest friend For this thy dying sorrow Thy pity without end Oh, make me thine forever And should I fainting be or oh, let me never never I'll live my love to thee or oh, let me never never I'll live my love to thee He was despised and avoided by others, a man who suffered, who knew sickness well, like someone from whom people hid their faces. He was despised and we didn't think about him. It was certainly our sickness that he carried and our sufferings that he bore, but we thought him afflicted struck down by God and tormented. He was pierced because of our rebellions and crushed because of our crimes. He bore the punishment that made us whole. By his wounds, we are healed. Like sheep, we had all wandered away, each going its own way, but the Lord let fall on him all our crimes. He was oppressed and tormented, but didn't open his mouth. Like a lamb being brought to the slaughter, like a, like a ewe silent before her shearers, he didn't open his mouth. Due to an unjust ruling, he was taken away. And his fate, who will think about it? He was eliminated from the land of the living struck dead because of my people's rebellion.
Now, there was a man named Joseph who was a member of the council. He was a good and righteous man. He hadn't agreed with the plan and actions of the council. He was from the Jewish city of Arimathea and eagerly anticipated God's kingdom. This man went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Taking it down, he wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid it in a tomb carved out of the rock, in which no one had ever been buried. It was the preparation day for the Sabbath, and the Sabbath was quickly approaching. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph. They saw the tomb and how Jesus' body was laid in it. Then they went away and prepared fragrant spices and perfumed oils. They rested on the Sabbath in keeping with the commandment. Come. 
thanks for worshiping uh, together tonight, friends. Um, I'll remind all of you that we'll continue our worship together for Easter Sunday. Each congregation has 10 a.m. Zoom uh, worship gatherings, and each congregation also has uh, live in-person outdoor gatherings. Uh, Oak Churches is at 8.30 a.m., uh, we gave you a little break on the sunrise service, uh, and that's going to be in Oak Church Garden. Um, and gathering churches will be at 4 p.m. on Sunday at Creekside at the soccer field. So bring a mask, bring a chair, and um, uh, continue our uh, celebration of Christ um, having died and Christ being raised and us with him. So as we go, friends, um, and after singing... Uh, about the wondrous cross. Go in this beautiful, terrible good news that God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Go. Amen. <laughs>